Okay, um, welcome everybody uh, to the ANU's uh, webinar on the Technology Investment Roadmap, Carbon Capture and Use as an Emerging Technology. Uh, before I start the proceedings, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on who I meet, that's the Ngunnawal people here in Canberra, but also acknowledge uh, those traditional owners on the lands on who you are standing or sitting uh, today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the government uh, launched the technology roadmap. Uh, this was uh, essentially a strategy which was intended to lay out a series of technologies which could take Australia into a uh, lower emissions future uh, and could give us a series of uh, advantages, uh, national advantages by doing so. So in that process, uh, it identified a series of priority technologies. There's five priority technologies and a series of emerging technologies and carbon capture and utilization was one of those emerging technologies. And that's why we're holding this event this evening, at least this evening, Australia time. And so what we um, have got today is we've got uh, three speakers. We've got uh, John Beaver from Carbon CO2 Value Australia. Uh, we've got Celia Sapa from CO2 Value Europe to talk about what's going on in Europe, and also Wojciech Lipinski from ANU. And I'll introduce those uh, people a little bit more fully later. But just a very quick um, sort of outline of uh, carbon capture and utilization, and sort of giving it a bit of a, a bit of a feel for the difference between that and carbon, carbon capture and storage, because these things sometimes do get confused. I'll just show up a single slide of, of one of the uh, sort of ways of, of looking at this um, and uh, doing a sort of a simple comparison. Um, so, Lamise, have I got that right? Can you see the screen? Sorry, Mark, what was that? So, can you see the, um, the slide? Carbon oh yeah, capture that's capture. perfect. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so this is just a simple slide. It's not intended to be complete, um, but it just shows a little bit about um, the differences between carbon capture and utilization and carbon capture and storage, just to clear up the um, any confusion there. Now, they're both similar in the sense that they are intended to uh, capture capture carbon dioxide and put it somewhere safe, away from the atmosphere, so it's not um, radiative active radiatively active as not contributing to climate change. However, that's pretty much where the similarities finish. And so as I've indicated here, there's, there's a whole series of almost diametrically opposed contrasts between carbon capture and use and carbon capture and storage. So carbon capture and use treats carbon dioxide as a resource, a valuable resource. Whereas CCS, carbon capture and storage, treats it as a waste product, something to be getting, gotten rid of. CCU adds value to the carbon dioxide and looks to um, add value to other processes as well. Whereas um, CCS costs money and it costs a lot of energy to implement. So you require a lot of energy to capture, li um, liquefy and inject the carbon dioxide into the ground. Uh, CCU can be part of a circular economy if we do it right. So if we start off with renewables and we use and reuse and reuse uh, the products from this, uh, we can uh, go into a circular economy, even if we're looking at the um, sub synthetic fuel component of CCU, uh, it's still substituting for fossil fuel use and not contributing to the atmospheric load. In contrast, a CCS is an old fashioned end of pipe solution where in fact, an actual end of pipe solution um, where we're effectively just trying to get rid of it and get it out of our, our minds, out of our system. CCU is effectively a series of new technologies um, attached to emerging industries, whereas CCS in a sense is existing technologies and it's attached to a series of sunset industries such as fossil fuel electricity generation. CCU is spatially flexible, whereas CCS typically is spatially constrained. There's only a limited number of opportunities to find that strata that's safe to put carbon dioxide into, um, whereas CCU can be essentially located anywhere. And finally, CCU, uh, as we're seeing it, is likely to be modular, upgradable and scalable, uh, whereas large scale CCS um, activities tend to be relatively fixed 
Um, so they're fixed in place and tend to be, because they're such large scale um, technologies implementations, they tend to be relatively um, uh, inflexible in terms of change. So that's all I wanted to say um, in this, but just to really point out that um, CCU and CCS are very different things. And so when we're talking tonight, we're talking about CCU, which is listed as a, an emerging technology in the um, technology roadmap, uh, whereas CCS is actually listed as a priority technology. So that's just framing what we're dealing with tonight. So, so um, when we're just uh, launching into the, uh, the speakers, um, uh, we've got three great speakers here tonight. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, first speaker up is um, Celia. So Celia Sapa um, is uh, um, sort of a, the, um, she's a, a Swiss climate scientist to start with. Um, she's specialised in greenhouse gas emissions and historical um, climate reconstructions. And now she's a, a climate expert and communications officer at CO2 Value Europe. So CO2 Value Europe is a, an entity um, which is looking to promote and expand the use of carbon capture and utilisation technologies in Europe. And it's the leading organisation globally who is doing this uh, sort of um, uh, sense making um, activities in relation to CCU. And uh, later we've got John Beaver who is uh, heading the CO2 Value Australia equivalent. So I will hand it over to you, Celia. Good afternoon. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the invitation to participate to this webinar. So may I have my slides, please? Great, thank you very much. So today I'm going to speak about uh, how CCU is integrated uh, in the EU and to show that CCU is a pillar to reach climate targets uh, in the EU. Next, please. So I'll go back to uh, what Mark just said about the difference between CCU and CCS, but uh, with a bit more of a concept or process perspective. So if we look at the reference production system, we have A, the production uh, industry that can be for chemicals or, or construction, et cetera, that will use fossil carbon as a resource, but also as a source of energy, and that will emit CO2. We have the refineries B, that will also emit CO2 and create fuels that we be used in the transport and all of these processes will emit CO2. Next please. When we speak about a context where we use CCS, we will have the capture, so there's a direct air capture um, of CO2 or the capture of CO2 directly at the point source, so directly from the industry, and this CO2 will be stored into the ground. This can involve a decrease of net CO2 emissions. It can create negative emissions, negative emissions that are needed to stay under the two degrees uh, Celsius warming under most of the climate scenarios presented in the IPCC reports. And this, is, this CCS involves quite high cost and potential risk. One of the challenges is to make sure that the CO2 is properly uh, sequestered in the soil and that it will not leak out and that it will not have other uh, environmental impacts. Next, please. If we look at the CCU concept, uh, we move a bit away from the uh, reference production system. So we still have A, uh, the production system, B, the refineries. What happened is that we can also capture the CO2 directly from the air or from the point sources, but we do not store this CO2 in the ground. We use it as a resource in the production line. So this, this allows to decrease the net CO2 emissions, to create negative emissions, especially when we use the CO2 directly to create building materials. So we mineralize, we sequester the CO2 quasi permanently in building materials. And this will create negative emissions when the CO2 is coming from direct air capture. But it allows also to move away from fossil resources. And this is the big difference with the CCS, is that it really changes um, our, our relation with, with the fossil resources. So for the, for the CCU, we allow to defossilize the industry in different ways, in creating, in creating chemicals from CO2 as a resource, and also in creating fuels using CO2 uh, as a resource. It can also allow to support the development of a circular economy. This is especially interesting when we make CO2 react with industrial residues, for example, to create, again, uh, um, building materials or different type of chemicals. And it allows to store energy, which is one of the biggest challenges we have to face now, uh, speaking of the energy transition via the power to X. And it creates a value, as Mark said very clearly before. But um, we do not 
say that CCU is the solution to everything. CCU is one of the solutions, and we find it very important to have an integrated vision and to add the CCS also in this vision, please click, to have an integrated uh, vision on the whole system. So CCU and CCS can be in some ways complementary. They do not have the same impact. They are not the same processes, but we should think about it in an integrated vision. And this is what the EU does, please. Um, so the last, last week, the European Parliament has firmly decided to take the global leadership in mitigating climate change and accepting with a large majority the first EU climate law. And this climate law acts uh, the carbon neutrality by 2050, but also a decrease of 60% in greenhouse gas emission by 2030. So to reach these goals, um, the roles of carbon capture and utilization and the role of carbon capture and storage are recognized as pillars. And the EU Green Deal is the umbrella of all the legislative packages and funding instruments for these transitions. That means that most instruments are or will soon be revised uh, to fulfill the obligation of this climate law. So it means that there are still a lot of uncertainties, but it also brings incredible opportunities and the chance to make sure that this issue is fairly recognized at the places where it's not recognized yet. Please. One important point where this issue is recognized is the EU uh, strategic energy plan. There is a priority that is called the CCU set, CCUS set plans, uh, where uh, CCU is uh, working together with CCS and is equally considered with CCS as a key uh, player to reach the target goals. And we are representing the CCU community in the implementation plan of this uh, framework via the, the, the IMPACTS 9 project. Please. Usually, we are not really advocating for, for for the, 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 um, the use of the word CCUS, we think it's very important to use CCU and CCS because we will speak about two different, uh, different processes, as I said before. But here in, in some of the EU instruments, the, CC, the, word, the term CCUS is, is still used. So I will say a few words about three instruments where CCU uh, is or will soon be included as a pillar. So first, the Green Deal call. So the EU Commission has decided to launch a 1 billion euro call for research and innovation projects uh, that respond to the climate crisis and uh, to help protect the European unique ecosystem and biodiversity. And this call is under the, the umbrella of the Horizon 2020 program and it comprises of 11 areas and two of these areas include a relevant subject uh, associated to CCU. Please. We have also the, in, yeah, the Innovation Fund uh, it is based on the emission trade trading system, so the, all the funding is coming from there. And um, CCU technology are now included as, as one of the four pillars of this innovation fund, again, together with the CCS, but it's considered equally. And we are working as an expert to define the criteria of uh, this funding system. And the fund will provide 10 billion euros over the next 10 years to support innovative uh, low carbon projects. And uh, so mostly 1 billion per year. And the first call has just been open a few months ago. And we have the important project of common EU interest. It's an instrument that is in development at the moment for lar large scale uh, transnational projects where member states receive the permission from the, from the EU, in fact, uh, to support industrial actors at levels that will otherwise not really be allowed um, by state, re state aid regulations. And uh, within this uh, EPCI, there is a series of strategic value chains that have been identified and in the development of this instrument, so during the, this development, and uh, it includes two subjects that are where CCU can be um, related. Please click. So now when we, we look more generally in the legislative framework, so not only about the funding, but the legislative framework, there are many instruments where CCU is included or where CCU could be in included or where CCU is in the phase of being included. CCU is now cited in many uh, of these instruments, but now it has to go from the citation to the actions. And that's what we are uh, strongly um, working at with our advocacy groups. So we do the advocacy with all the actor of the, of the CCU value chain. So our members, industrial actors, uh, research and development actors, etc. We work uh, on most of these uh, legislative packages, but three are of uh, key importance here. Please click. Uh, 
So here's the EU sustainable taxonomy, where CCU is not yet included, but we are working in this direction because it's very important that all solutions are discussed there. There is a RED2, uh, so the Renewable Energy Directive, um, that is being revised. And there it's extremely important that uh, typically the role of CO2-based fuel is properly recognized there. We we, it's also important that all the type of fuels that allow the same impact are recognized fairly and equally, and we are advocating in this direction. But there is also the EU uh, emission trade system. And this is a very important system where CCU is not included yet, but we are working uh, very much in this direction. Uh, all these instruments are being totally revised, so it allows them to, to discuss again the basis and to include uh, CCU there. So we represent the, the CCU community um, in, in Europe and we, 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 we represent the, the, the position of the CCU community in Europe. So we wrote different papers um, to advocate for, for important points in this instrument. One of these points is that we request that CO2 emitted from an ETS installation when it is permanently stored, typically through mineralization into a building material, it should be recognized as not having been emitted according to the, the ETS, and it should be discounted from the installation, installation um, allowance obligations. And we also advocate for the fact that CO2-based fuels, so e-fuels, that are used in the EU ETS uh, installation should be recognized as neutral, uh, so in, neutral in, in carbon, in, in CO2, when they uh, fulfill certain strict conditions, conditions that still has to be discussed. And they should be considered in the same way, as I said before, as other um, alternative fuels, such as uh, biogas or biomass-based uh, fuels. So if you wish to have more information on our position and specific activity uh, on creating a favorable legislative framework for CCU deployment, please go on our website. We have quite some information. We have a position paper and you can register to our newsletter where we give a regular updates on this subject, please. If we look uh, more in terms of projects, uh, so the, the EU sees a steadily growing number of projects launched uh, at the demo and commerce, commercialization uh, level. There are more than 50 uh, high TRL, so TRL for technology readiness level uh, projects everywhere on the continent. So here I give you uh, three examples, please. So there is a Norsk e-fuel project. It's a project uh, in, the, in the, the, the south of Norway. There they do direct air capture, and then they use the CO2 that is captured with renewable energy. So they use electrolysis. So they electrolyze the water to create hydrogen, green hydrogen, to make jet fuel. And this project uh, has recently been launched and their plant will produce uh, 10 million liters of jet fuel by 2023 and 100 million liters in 2026. So to show you how fast the upscaling can go when you have the proper uh, ecosystem and when you have the proper uh, also legislative uh, context. Another project is a, the power to gas project of Jupiter 1000 in Marseille, in the south of France. It's a power to gas project, means that you use electricity to create natural gas or CO2 and electricity to create natural gas. So they use industrial CO2 emissions and renewable energy, again, in doing electrolysis to create e-methane. And this e-methane is already now injected in the, um, uh, in the national natural gas network. This is especially interesting in comparison with, with, um, with hydrogen because we can just use this, this methane the same way that we use uh, natural gas in general. And um, you have the carbstone technologies. So it's uh, a technology that's already commercialized. They use industrial residues and CO2 to create stone. And the first pavement made out of this, of this technology, of this carbstone technologies, uh, has been built last month in Belgium. So you can see that things are really moving on and uh, there are more and more projects and it's not um, science fiction that CCU is really happening now. But the point is that we cannot do CCU alone. We need a proper legislative framework, we need market incentives and we need proper synergies uh, to have a, a good CCU deployment, please. And I will end with uh, this slide showing that it's absolutely crucial to work all along the CCU value chain 
to develop uh, at large scale uh, CCU technologies. So when I speak about the CCU value chain, I speak about upstream the CO2 emitters, the low carbon er energy sources, the hydrogen sources, the raw material and waste. And in the middle, we have all the conversion uh, technologies. This is the DNA of CO2 uh, value Europe, I can say. And with the CO2, we focus uh, on the routes to produce three types of products, so it's chemical, building, chemical building blocks, uh, synthetic fuels and building materials, as I said before. And then downstream of the chain, we have the refining, the distribution uh, infrastructures, and of course, the creation of a market for CO2 products there um, market incentives are absolutely necessary and we work together with a very broad um, group of, 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 of partners of stakeholders from the multinational companies uh, from SMEs regional clusters and uh, research institutions we have more or less one third of, of our uh, members and partners who are coming from uh, multinational companies and one third coming from the research inst institution. So it's very important to, to, to bring everybody together. And we need the multinational companies to, for the upscaling and we need the research institutions, the startups and the SMEs um, to develop the technology. So it's very important to have again an integrated vision. With that, I would like to, to thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, if you want more information, do not hesitate to contact me or uh, to visit our website. Thank you. Many thanks, Celia. That was a great um, presentation and particularly that final point, which is you actually need an integrated uh, approach to get the best uh, results uh, from this uh, set of activities. So, um, and also just I should um, um, also add that in addition to the uh, synthetic fuels, chemical feedstocks and building materials elements of uh, some carbon capture and usage, there are also the natural resource based ones. There's um, uh, um, carbon enhancement in soils um, and there's also capture in vegetation and soils. Uh, and so, so the, there's a whole range of technologies, um, but just tonight we are focusing on those main three. Um, our next speaker is uh, Wojciech Lipinski, is a uh, professor, Wojciech Lipinski, I should say. Um, Wojciech is the uh, leader of the solar thermal group uh, at ANU. Uh, he's an extremely well-known scientist. He's worked extensively in terms of the fields of uh, using thermal um, energy uh, for chemical processes. Um, he's got this fantastic solar thermal set up um, at ANU and he leads a, a group of more than two dozen people. Uh, so welcome Wojciech. Thank you very much, Mark. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. So everyone should see now um, my slides. I hope that works well. I'm going to tell you very briefly about the production of aviation fuel, renewable aviation fuels using uh, carbon dioxide captured from the atmosphere and other sources. Aviation has contributed about 2.4% of all anthropogenic CO2 emissions in 2018, beside other pollutants. And um, predictions are that the use of jet fuel in aviation will only increase until 2050. In OECD countries, this increase will be about by a factor of two. In non-OECD countries, mainly China and uh, Southeast Asia, it will be by a factor of four. This is a significant increase, and this means we will have even more CO2 emissions from aviation directly into the atmosphere. Now, in order to uh, tackle this problem, we can consider various options. One of them is to use other alternative solutions to stop using kerosene jet fuel and replace them, for example, with hydrogen or um, electric propulsion driven by um, hydrogen. However, these solutions are not straightforward to be implemented at a mass scale in the quite relatively short time frame we are facing to mitigate the major climate issue related to um, CO2 emissions. So an alternative solution would be to leave the inf aviation infrastructure, all the airplanes and turbines as they are, to uh, to make use of the 100 years of investment into optimization of that infrastructure, optimization of jet turbines, and which are very efficient these days, clean, and also they produce not that much noise at, as they used to, but to replace the fuel itself. So we would need to replace the carbon in hydrocarbons 
with, from the fossil carbon with renewable carbon from the atmosphere. And there are two ways. One is the biomass, fuels based on biomass where carbon is fixed during the photosynthesis process. And then um, the biomass is further processed using renewable energy to high value synthesis gas from which we can produce not only kerosene, but also other hydrocarbons, for example, diesel for sea transportation, which is another important um, industrial niche for uh, decarbonization. And then once we use these fuels, we again produce uh, with the state of the art in infrastructure, again, we produce water and carbon dioxide and then we need to capture this carbon dioxide back. There is no problem with water basically because it will condense and precipitate, but carbon dioxide will stay there unless we remove it. An alternative option is to employ man-made machines for carbon dioxide um, capture. And then we need to put pay, uh, we need to put more energy to reduce that carbon. It's harder to reduce carbon dioxide than to process biomass to produce synthesis gas. But once we achieve that step, we can use other state-of-the-art steps uh, to close the carbon cycle. So I'm going to show you a few examples how, how we can um, capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, basically, I'm not going to talk about biomass in my short presentation. That's a separate topic. Um, the reason I think carbon direct carbon capture from the air will be important in the near future is that um, biomass needs relatively large land area and relatively large amount of water to grow. Why direct CO2 separation from the atmosphere can be basically done without extra water and on a small area. One example, the first example comes from Switzerland. This is the company Climeworks who built a demonstration plant just outside Zurich. They use a two-step step process. The, in the first step, they absorb CO2 on a sorbent. And in the second step, the sorbent is lightly heated to about 100 degrees Celsius when the carbon dioxide is released and stored in pure form. And that carbon dioxide can be used for production of fuels. So this is the first commercial CO2 capture plant in the world. The second example comes from Canada, um, the company Carbon Engineering. Um, their process is different. It has two cycles um, in which carbon is bound first to a sorbent and then um, in the second, between the cycles, the carbon is exchanged between different chemicals. Eventually, pure CO2 is separated out of the air as a result of this two cycle process. They built a pilot plant and collected performance data based on which they, um, they designed a commercial scale reference plant and derived even some uh, techno-economic metrics for their technology. The third example comes from the United States, from Arizona State University, the group led by Professor Klaus uh, Lackner. They developed a process based on moisture swing absorption and using this process, they built an artificial tree. In that solution, there are no fans, there are no blowers. The all air movement is natural by wind. Um, so then they demonstrated separation of uh, carbon dioxide with less energy penalty because there is no need to drive those um, fans. The next example comes from ANU. Um, this is a process, very well-known process actually, based on calcination carbonation um, chemical looping, where in the first step, the sorbent is carbonated with uh, carbon dioxide coming not from the air, but from flue gases. Um, this process is a high temperature process and it is not thermodynamically favorable for um, to be employed with uh, CO2 sources with relatively low CO2 concentration, such as the atmospheric air. And in the second step, the sorbent is regenerated using high temperature um, thermal energy, for example, coming from solar thermal concentrators. And we close the loop for the sorbent. 
Currently, we, we are preparing an experimental car, um, campaign to test the new reactor prototype that will be driven by emulated concentrated sunlight in our lab here at the ENU. Um, and we expect to have the results uh, still this year. Another example is from the group led by Dr. Shaolin Wang, a freshly awarded ARC DECRA fellow who has developed a process based on gas hydrates. Um, in the process of gas hydrate formation, CO2 is captured from CO2-rich mixture. And in the formation process, CO2 is trapped in cages made from water. That's the formation step, which is exothermal, energy is released. In the endothermal step, where we decompose those hydrates, CO2 is released to a pure CO2 storage, which can be further used for fuel production or for agriculture, any other uses to valorize this CO2. And the third example from ANU comes from the team of Anna Herring, Adrian Shepard and Penny King, um, the, who jointly work between the Research School of Physics and the Research School of Earth Sciences on both carbon capture and storage and carbon capture and utilization. In the first approach, um, CO2 is pumped into rock formations and basically it gets stuck there. It is bound to those porous media um, where it is sequestered. In the second approach, when CO2 is utilized, CO2 is reused uh, together with magnesium oxide and water to uh, form highly durable and high strength construction materials, carbonate cements, um, that can um, be used in the con construction industry. So beside these examples, of course, there are other examples of using lime and mortar um, to capture CO2 in the construction um, industry, but production of lime and mortar also releases um, carbon dioxide. So they are carbon neutral, not carbon uh, negative if, if we use the state-of-the-art lime uh, industry. And to conclude, a few words about Australia. Australia is a very interesting case. It is a uh, land geographically located close to Asia uh, with relatively small population next to uh, basically the um, most populated area in the world. Um, it has a very large land area, more than 7.6 million square kilometers. Um, and that land area is, ha, um, has um, vast renewable energy resources, solar radiation and uh, wind energy. This area is ideal to build CO2 capture uh, plants and drive them using that solar radiation or wind energy. And not only to capture the carbon from the atmosphere, but also to process it because Australia has a very long uh, coastline. So, that means we can desalinate um, seawater to a level, to an industrial level, which means salinity doesn't have to be as low as for, for potato uh, water. And finally, um, Australia will have to solve its two major issues in the future. One is energy security, especially when it comes to liquid hydrocarbons. And the second one is the um, sea and air transportation. Australia will forever depend on sea and air transportation. It is difficult, as I explained, to replace hydrocarbons uh, in aviation. For sea transportation, we can still think about replacing diesel with um, other forms of uh, fuels, such as uh, pure hydrogen or ammonia. But um, of course, what I said about aviation fuels today also applies to solar or renewable production of diesel for maritime transportation. So thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Wojciech. Um, so whilst we're just uh, um, uh, lining up to um, introduce John Beaver in a sec, just reminding people to uh, vote on the questions. So, so you can go into the Q&A section and you can, you can vote um, which questions you would like to have answered. And so 
uh, we can get a sense of the priorities from the audience as to which questions are most important. So um, if you, don't, that's good. Uh, so our next speaker and last speaker is John Beaver. Um, so John is the chair of CO2 Value Australia. He's also the chair of the Green Mag Group. Uh, and that group is uh, actively uh, engaging in industri industrial applications of absorption of carbon dioxide into building materials. Over to you, John. Can you turn off my mute? We have, we have that. There we go, John, you're all good to go. Excellent. Uh, well, my first brief is to uh, talk about the current state of uh, CCU uh, in, in Australia. And um, it's, uh, CCU in Australia is e evolving very fast, but it's from a small base. But we have great potential here. Um, and that's because Australia has two comparative advantages uh, when it comes to CCU. And that is Australia's existing uh, resources industry, where we have world leading technology and services uh, and, and logistics know how, which can be applied readily uh, to the carbon capture and utilization. But you add that intellectual property to the, and, and infrastructure, I should say, uh, to the potential for renewables in the wide brown land and you have powerful and potentially profitable combination. It was uh, Professor Ross Garneau uh, who recently said that Australia should be a renewable energy superpower, which enables uh, low carbon manufacturing and CCU will be part of that low carbon manufacturing future. Now, CO2 value was, was formed last year to focus on uh, CCU policy. Uh, we're not a traditional industry association, we're uh, more of a, a, a policy research group. Uh, we had found, as, as Mark said, that uh, very early on that the world leaders in this space are uh, CO2 value Europe. Uh, and so uh, Australia late last year became, you know, the first country outside of uh, the EU to close a uh, memo, MOU uh, of collaboration with uh, CO2 value uh, Europe, uh, which is proving to be extremely valuable to us as we accelerate uh, our development. Now we see CCU uh, happening in all of the sectors that Mark flagged in his introduction, uh, but two of those are very well illustrated by uh, a couple of our CVA members. Now, mineral carbonation uh, technology reacts captured CO2 with widely available low grade minerals or industrial wastes to make building materials like uh, plasterboards, cements, bricks. Mineral Carbonation International, uh, we believe is, 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 is world competitive in this space. And after seven years uh, of R&D, MCI uh, hopes very soon to be announcing its first uh, demonstration plant. Also, synthetic fuels, including green hydrogen and uh, uh, e-methanol should soon be produced by another CVA member called Able Energy. Able will combine CO2 captured from biomass from uh, forest product with hydrogen uh, electrolyzed by Hydro Energy at, a Bell, at its Bell Bay Power Fuels project in partnership with the engineering giant Tyson Crook. Now we feel we're about five years behind Europe, but with these projects like these coming to fruition now, we, we should begin catching up. Now, the impact of the roadmap on CCUS. From what we've seen so far, uh, the roadmap should be positive for carbon capture utilization in, in Australia, but we think its real significance is as part of a wider policy position of positioning that's going on within the Australian government. Uh, we saw the investment in new energy technologies and the modern manufacturing strategy released by the Prime Minister and the relevant ministers just before and just after 
the roadmap. And what is really positive here, if you'll excuse some optimism, is uh, that we now have an Australian government talking about technology to tackle climate change after years of political standoff in this country. The roadmap's statement itself, as Mark said, lists five uh, priority technologies, all of which you know, we in CO2 value Australia's support. And, uh, but as he said, carbon capture utilisation was not one of those priorities. It was classed as emerging technology, which to quote, is one that has strong transformative potential and is likely to play an important role in Australia's transition to low emissions. Now the roadmap certainly has some interesting new uh, programs such as tech, a technology co-investment fund, a CCUS fund and export hydrogen hub, microgrids and energy efficiency programs. But as yet, we do not have the details of how those uh, programs will work in practice. Similarly, we do not yet know what being classed as emerging, as distinct from priority, will mean when it comes to competing for support from those new programs. But we have to be fair and admit that given the early stage of carbon capture utilisation technology in Australia, it is realistic to say that CCU is still emerging at this time. But things are moving fast. The future in, of CCU in Australia is bright because, as Mark said in the intro, it's all about value, it's not about costs. Rational businesses will invest in capture, carbon capture utilisation technologies where they see it is profitable to do so. And when there is a carbon price, and I say when uh, there is a carbon price, CCU will make even more business sense. So we see three more things being needed to boost the uptake or the acceleration of CCU in Australia. First, we need a greater awareness of what CCU is and what it can deliver. And we had great news earlier this month when Dyser uh, told a webinar on carbon recycling that CSIRO will proceed with a six month study called commoditization of CO2. Now commoditization to us means utilization. The significance of this is, this will be the first independent analysis of the industry development and the climate change potential of CCU in Australia. And we expect it will guide future investment decisions in industry and future policy, government policy in Australia in the way that uh, a, a similar study in 2013 kick-started you know, the CCU uh, movement in, in Europe. Second, there's a gap in Australian government industry development programs between the R&D, which turns the, you know, the, the, you know, the bright idea into a, a technology and the deployment support programs such as CEFC run, once those technologies are proven to be commercial. As far as we know yet, the roadmap does not bridge you know, that demonstration gap. Um, I hope we may be proven wrong, but we haven't seen that detail yet. Third, and, and very importantly, we need actual CCU technologies to move out of the lab and into operation at an industrial scale. And we hope and expect, you know, the two I mentioned just, just before, will do that soon. When they do, what benefits will CCU industry bring to Australia? Well, taking as given the emission reductions, uh, we see three industry development benefits from increased CCU. The first is giving emitters another technology option and one which adds value uh, while it reduces emissions. The research that's been done in America uh, to date estimates that the new CCU industry could lock away about 10% of current emissions by 2030. 
as Celia said, CCU will not solve you know, the emissions problem alone, but it can be part of a portfolio of solutions. That new CCU industry is anticipated to be worth about 5 trillion US dollars a year by 2030. So we're talking, we're talking real, real industry here. The second benefit is many, if not most of the new jobs created by a CCU industry in Australia will be in regional Australia. And that's fairly, fairly, fairly obvious because that's where so much of the uh, emissions uh, come from and where so much of the reactive agents that are needed to work with the uh, transformation of CO2 um, uh, are located. The third benefit we anticipate is the creation of a new services export industry built around CCU technology. If we can make CCU technologies work here, we will be able to export that intellectual property, that expertise in just the same way that Australia exports mining technologies, logistics and project management uh, services now. To wrap up, if CCU technologies develop as we think they will, we, will, we could well see a new industrial sector emerge here, which leverages Australia's particular strength, some of which, some of which Wojciech mentioned in his session. This CCU industry could well be described as advanced manufacturing. In fact, the Australian government's modern manufacturing strategy could turn out to be more relevant to the future of CCU in this country than the roadmap itself. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, John, particularly for those final reflections um, on the uh, pol policy sort of emphasis there. So um, we've got about 15 minutes left to answer some questions. Uh, so I'll just direct those questions to the uh, the panel. Um, so the first one is from Adrian Hines, and uh, and it's, the question is, how scalable is the negative emissions potential of CCU through something like mineralisation? So give us a number in gigatons carbon dioxide per year. Maybe I can comment on that, Mark, if 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 you wish. Sure. I think it's very it, it it's very hard. Um, to, to, to make this kind of quantification because it's very much technology dependent and also dependent on the substrate that is, is used. For example, if we use uh, typically uh, um, industrial slag uh, as substrate to, 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 to mineralize the CO2. But uh, on the horizon by 2050, we can say that it should be a few gigaton of uh, CO2 that could be uh, sequestered in um, in, in, in materials. So we, there is a, for example, the technology I was speaking about is carbstone technology. This is already commercialized. Uh, they can store 350 kilo of CO2 per cubic meter of materials. So to give you an idea. And the biggest uh, challenge there is to store as much CO2 as possible per uh, ton of material, of course. Um, Mark, let me have a go on the mineralization angle. Um, mineralization uses, uh, you know, low grade uh, mineralized rocks like serpentinites. Um, and these are the most commonly occurring rocks in the surface uh, of the earth. Um, we don't really see the availability of those rocks to react with captured CO2 as being the constraint uh, for CCU. The more immediate constraint is going to be the size of the markets uh, for the product generated by uh, the transformation of CO2. Uh, that's one constraint. The other constraint is in some of these building materials like cement and uh, plasterboards and so forth, you, you have oligopolistic um, supply, you know, organizations. You have established supply chains, uh, which are very, very hard to penetrate. Uh, and the way CCU will in fact be taken up into those supply chains is when the economic benefits uh, are combined you know, with the social benefits of uh, responding to uh, expectations for reduced emissions, 
uh, and, and the CCU products are introduced and emitted into those established supply chains. So at the moment, um, any, any, any numbers that you put on uh, gigatons through CCU uh, would really be guesstimates. And I would, I would say, uh, wait six months and see what CSIRO says, because we will begin to get independent critical analysis around these very questions. So just um, chipping in there, so there's a, a paper by Sabine Fuss and colleagues a couple of years ago in environmental research letters where she looked at the potentials for different activities. It didn't include that mineralization, but typically for the different things that they looked at, uh, they were between a half and two up to five gigatons of carbon dioxide per year if, if it was maximized. Uh, I, I guess a couple of points there. Um, one is that uh, at the moment, we're producing, you know, close to 40 um, gigatons of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel and cement manufacturing. Um, so a gigaton here or there um, is really important. But as we've pointed out by itself, none of these technologies is enough. It's actually about having a whole ecosystem of technologies um, and having a whole ecosystem of policy and the industrial support mechanisms that is actually really important. The, the other one is that in that paper, in relation to direct air capture, um, uh, the, the evaluation of the potential size of direct air capture um, was unlimited in that paper. So it's exactly the point that John was making, is that the limits to this are largely about the demand um, for uh, cheap carbon dioxide that can be used in multiple different ways. So um, just uh, unless you want to say anything, Wojciech, I would add that uh, indeed, uh, currently the CO2 capture uh, technologies uh, compete with CO2 sources, for, uh, for example, from calcination and cement. And uh, that's, uh, you know, doesn't help these new technologies because uh, to, to break the, you know, to, to pave the way to the new economy based on the atmospheric CO2. However, any form of reuse of uh, CO2, whether it comes from lime and cement, which we have to live with for a while, it's hard to imagine we can change these construction materials in the near future, or from the um, capture, uh, or, or from the uh, installations that already industrially capture CO2, help, will help to, and as you said, Mark, um, the ecosystem of those different slightly competing technologies in the future and approaches will help us probably, uh, hopefully, to achieve the targets. Fantastic. Thanks for check. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll um, take the liberty of skipping the, the first, the top um, question from Will Howard and just move to the one from Owen Cameron first, because I think it's an important point. Um, and that question uh, is um, someone who says, I don't understand how CCS and CCU creates negative emissions. Can you please elaborate on this point? I think, um, Celia, you might be a good start here. Yeah. So negative emissions means that uh, we remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So until now, we have already put too much CO2 in the atmosphere to reach the climate goals of the Paris, Paris Agreement, so to stay well below 2 degrees Celsius. So right now, we have no choice than removing already the CO2 from the atmosphere. So it's not only about decreasing the net CO2 emissions, but also to remove CO2 from this atmospheric load. And we can do it in two ways, or in capturing this CO2 directly from the atmosphere and storing it underground, or we can capture it uh, from the atmosphere and store it in materials. And uh, to have an efficient effect, I would say when we speak about material, it has to be uh, captured on long time scale. And when we speak about mineralization, we in fact uh, solidified CO2 in building material. We, min we, mineral we mineralize it in the building material. So we can consider that it's permanent permanently sequestered as it is in the soil. Knowing that in the soil, you can also mineralize the CO2 in the soil. So this mineralization really allows a, a stable a sequestration of the CO2, so or in the soil, or in the building material. The advantage of doing it in the building material is first that it's cre it creates a value and then not a cost, which is the case of, of CCS and that it can also um, help to develop a circular economy because it also allowed to use industrial waste and the CO2 to create materials so to sequester uh, the CO2. Thanks, Celia. 
And, and just one other part of that, I guess, is a really important to have renewable energy um, injected into that system all the way along. So, so your whole value chain is renewables powered because you're not getting the footprint, the life cycle accumulation of emissions um, in that product. Um, John, you wanted to make a point. Well, I'd just like to add to what uh, Celia said, uh, because it's a very good question. Um, synthetic fuels uh, don't uh, sequester um, CO2 permanently. Uh, in, in effect, what they do is recycle uh, CO2 and prevent it, you know, the, the situation for the accumulation uh, in the atmosphere getting worse. So we have a distinction in a sense between the permanent uh, locking away in materials uh, by, by chemical transformations and, and the recycling uh, aspect uh, with, with fuels, which should be acknowledged. Thanks, John. Okay, so we'll move to the next question, uh, which is from Will Howard. Um, would you class the use of carbon dioxide for enhanced oil recovery as um, utilisation? I don't. <laughs> yeah. I don't. Yeah, no. and in CO2 Value Europe, we are also clearly uh, defining a scope and enhanced oil recovery is not part of, of CCU for us because it does not allow defossilization to, it does not allow to move away from, from fossil resources. And for us, uh, one of the key thing of CCU is to move away from fossil resources. Mm. Yeah, uh, our definition of uh, utilization is the, C, the, the CO2 is transformed, uh, you know, and uh, uh, EOR uh, is really taking the captured CO2 and putting it in its admittedly compressed form uh, underground. Now, I'm not saying CS, C, uh, CCS is uh, terrible. You know, we see the two as complementing uh, in, in different circumstances. Uh, but our definition is that you take the captured CO2 and turn it into something else, which doesn't apply with EOR will. If I may quickly add something on, on what you just said, uh, Sean, I think that the way to think about CCU, CCU and CCS in this context is that first, all, uh, all CO2 emissions should be avoided as much as possible. The CO2 emissions that cannot be avoided should be recycled. And only emissions that cannot be avoided and that cannot be recycled should be put in the ground. So this is a bit of our vision on the, on the European side. Thanks, Silly. So next question from Darren Jarvis. Um, this is slightly off, off um, CCU per se, but it's probably relevant. So have the parameters for the proposed EU carbon border tax been defined as yet? So I'm, I'm not fully sure that I'm the right person to answer that because I'm not the one responsible to do advocacy in that sense there. Uh, to my knowledge, this mechanism is relatively new and uh, many parameters are still under discussion. So my feeling is that it's not yet uh, determined. Yeah, and that's my understanding as well. So um, probably our last one um, is, uh, um, is, is the question about um, panel's opinion on government's policy to support CCS in the tech roadmap and soil carbon measurement as climate change mitigation actions. Uh, there's a comment, they both seem end of pipe measures with soil carbon measurement, not even a mitigation activity. Um, any perspectives from the panel? Um. So from my perspective, as long as the CCS and CCU technologies are not just used to further boost the use of fossil fuels, um, it, we should basically go for it. However, if the, these technologies are means to extend the lifetime of um, conventional fossil powered um, energy or, or power plants, um, one has to think carefully if that's the way uh, to go, if the investment should not switch to renewable energy. So definitively there is a learning curve with carbon capture, carbon capture and utilization sequestration. And the current policy that uh, the Australian government is uh, proposing will help to implement these technologies at a large scale. But um, also, we should think how to basically phase out the original fossil fuels at the same time. We should not extend their use for a too long time because then we don't have measures to bring this carbon dioxide back onto the ground. Mm 
So, so um, thank you, Wojciech. And um, so this actually comes to the end of our allocated time. So, and we'd like to close our events on time. Um, uh, but uh, but there's clearly a, quite a few questions which have remained unanswered in the Q and A. And so, luckily, all of our panelists have offered to stay online for a few extra minutes. Um, uh, so, if you think of this as the equivalent of talking to people after a conference, um, or after a talk, and you, when you come up and have a chat. Um, so, so I just want to formally um, thank the speakers, uh, Celia uh, Wojciech and John, um, for their presentations and also answering the questions this evening. Um, also, remind people that this uh, um, event has been recorded and will be available on the CCI website, so you can uh, have a look at that at your leisure if you need to, or someone else can do um, that. And, uh, and also I'd like to thank uh, Lamise and Claire for organizing us and doing the logistics um, so well as, uh, and also Juliet as they always do. So I'll actually call this uh, event to a formal close. Um, but as I said, if people want to stay online to continue the Q and A, um, we can do so for about another 10, maybe 15 minutes at max. So thanks again for everyone and uh, we'll continue, but feel free to log off at this stage. So, so the next question uh, to our panelists, um, are there real world examples of major leakage from carbon capture and storage? Um, I'm not quite sure if this is the right panel to ask this question. I'm no, I, I, I do, I'm reluctant you know, to answer that. It's not, not really my field. I, I'm reluctant as well, but I think the question could also be, do we have the proper technologies to be able to identify CO2 leakage at the moment. And I think this is maybe not, uh, not fully the case. So there are a lot of work also to, to working on, on this. So how to identify leakages, this is a, a big sector of, of improvement also, but yeah. 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 Okay, um, thanks for that. Uh, so the next question from John Hay is, will there be an expected dollar value per tonne of carbon dioxide um, and would this be based on the um, accounting units that Australia uses? Well, perhaps, um, Celia, is, is there a plan in Europe as to how, you know, the, the sort of carbon tax would play out in this space? In, in Europe, for now, the state of the art is that CCU is recognised as a, as, a, as a key uh, pillar uh, in this uh, uh, climate change mitigation uh, process. We are not speaking about numbers yet, about how it should be taxed, and we try to prevent to give a, a number on, on the price of CO2 because we think it's a little bit too early to do so. Yep. I think we can answer that in part in, in, in Australia. Um, one of the changes announced before the roadmap by Minister Taylor was that CCS will be admitted to the ERF, you know, the Emissions Reduction Fund. Uh, which means we have to have a method uh, by which you can measure uh, and, and certify the legitimacy uh, of, of the um, uh, sequestration. Uh, and that working, there is a working group uh, being put together already to um, uh, design, articulate, uh, you know, that method. Uh, we understand uh, from, from, from DISA and from the Minister's statement that once the CCS uh, method is created, there will be uh, a CCU method, which will mean that both CCS and CCU, some way down the track, some time down the track, because these things take a while, uh, will be able to access the ERF and the, uh, what's it, the AQs, the Australian Carbon Credit yeah. Units, at the moment, I think, are... Uh, being sold at about 17 something dollars uh, 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 each at the moment. Yeah. I think that's a ton. So that's, 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 that's the nearest we get to a carbon price under the existing Australian arrangements. Yeah. yeah. So, so just in, in terms of the sort of the, you know, financial and dollar values, so as, as an example, direct air capture um, costs uh, in, in that uh, review by Sabine Fuss and colleagues, uh, the, the, you know, the sort of central um, cost was around about 150 US dollars a tonne of carbon dioxide. 
but but some much much lower and some much higher. That was the estimates of costs. Um, so in that sort of scenario, uh, uh, the cost of carbon, the um, you know uh, price on carbon, may be something in the region of 10% of the of the costs of of direct air capture. So if you're thinking that that's a, an offset. But then, of course, then there's the value proposition from the products, which may be produced by that um, capture of carbon dioxide. So the equation um, is really very starting to be very dependent on the nature of that carbon price and of the value proposition of um, what you're producing out of the CCU activities. And uh, and I suspect uh, as the price of uh, direct air capture and similar technologies comes down is that um, what you'll find is that that will flip fairly quickly um, into something which is relatively positive. So um, uh, the next, next question again from Darren Jarvis is, um, how will Australian companies compete given the relative scale of investment being committed in Europe? Uh, what will bring multinationals to invest here prefer preferentially? That's a great question um, for all three panellists, I think. I think one aspect is of, uh, for a CO2 capture from the atmosphere, that these are highly energetic processes. You know, the energy dem demand is quite high. And Australia has these vast renewable energy resources, which can be used in a more or less straightforward way now. Um, to um, capture CO2 here domestically. Um, it is uh, at least, I think, uh, one aspect of why, why Australia can be competitive in the future. If I may add to that, I think it's not only about the capture, it's also about the conversion. And the conversion is also requires also very much uh, um, uh, renewable energy when we want to use green hydrogen especially so I think definitely Australia is a, is, a, is a very competitive actor there as we need ecosystem with a lot of renewable energy and uh, I think there is, if there is one country in the world that can provide that it's, it's Australia. I won't repeat uh, you know, what, what, what my colleagues have just said uh, but there is another angle to this as well and uh, that is that the Australian industry will not uh, compete with Europe and America and uh, Asia in in every respect, uh, or in every in in every sector. Australian industry will focus in those areas where we do have advantages, uh, which come from our space, from the renewable energies, uh, from our resources handling processes. Um, so it you know, there's, there's there's no way uh, that we we can compete in everything, um, but as uh, uh, I think Alan Finkel said uh, in, in, in a, a, a webinar last week, we have to find out those areas where uh, our technologies can give us you know, uh, uh, particular benefits given our natural resources. Yeah. That, th thanks, uh, John. And, and I think that, that particularly brings out a point, which is that actually is an active stance. Where, where you're going out and actively evaluating um, rather than a passive stance, which is, um, you know, watching what goes on elsewhere. And, and so, so one of the challenges here, I think, is for Australia to move into a more active stance in terms of this. Even though it's listed as an emerging technology, it's not a, a wait and watch view. It's actually a um, let's try some things out view is the one that I'd um, have a preference for. So, um, so the next question is again from Darren Jarvis, who's been very busy on the on the questions. Um, so, why would investment be directed uh, to direct air capture projects um, when more concentrated CO two streams are relatively available from large industries, especially power, cement, etc.? Um, and uh, so, so the question is, um, why would go for dilute CO two in the atmosphere versus concentrated in flue gas? If I may take the, the word here, I think it's both have to go together. The impact is not the same. Again, if we do direct air capture, we get negative emissions. If we do a source point capture, we reduce the, the CO2, um, uh, the net CO2 emissions. Um, and it's also a question of, of timeline. We know if we look at the energy uh, system models, that the main source of CO2 that you will be uh, utilized now until 2030 to 2035 will be the, the CO2 coming from the point source. 
and where we will have much less CO2 from the point source, it's then the direct air capture that will take the lead there. So it's really a question also of thinking again in an integrated way and on the, on, on the, on the, the time scale uh, following the different uh, climate targets of 2030 and 2050. When 2050, the, the, the direct air capture there will really play a key role because most of the of the, the, the efforts will be needed. Uh, most of the effort that will be needed will be coming from, from negative emissions or so from direct air, air, air capture. Thanks, Celia. So, uh, any other comments there? Um, Wojciech, you have a view. Um, in addition to um, CO2 capture from the air, of course, when we capture uh, CO2 from point sources, we, ex uh, we extend the retention we, um, of the CO2 in man-made systems, anthropogenic systems, which reduces the um, emissions, of course. I think at some point where um, we will be phasing out fossil fuel-based power generation sector, we will be left still with some sectors, lime, cement, steel making perhaps, which will be um, CO2 rich, but probably not sufficient to um, replace the fossil based uh, carbon that we inject uh, into our energy sector. So um, I don't have numbers at hand to convince everyone that uh, which is, um, scenario is likely to follow, but I believe we will see a gradual transition first um, from the cheaper sources of CO2, like point sources, towards the more expensive, which is the distributed CO2 um, everywhere, basically. Similarly to power generation, the transition is from those uh, con um, let's say large scale power plants towards more distributed systems. Um, that's, that's probably is going to happen with CO2 as well. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just heading to our last question. So we've got um, three questions which are tied on, on three. So I'll just uh, make a selection. Um, so this is a question from an anonymous attendee, a, a knowledge sharing focused question. Is there a project list that is available for CCU projects across the world and or a body who is measuring and reporting on CCU industry process as it develops. Yeah. I think this is a good one to finish on. Um, what's going on? How can we keep track of it? Yeah. So at, at CO2 Value Europe, uh, we are gathering all the knowledge on CCU. One of our key priority is to create a collective intelligence uh, on CCU. So we are working on a global database um, with all the CCU project, all the companies and all the actors that are involved in CCU projects. At least the CCU as we consider it. So we have the three routes that are CO2 to chemicals, CO2 to fuels and CO2 to building materials. So all the CCU that is good for the economy and good for the climate. And uh, this um, database will be uh, available for our members and partners and certainly uh, publicly uh, in, uh, in, in some months, uh, hopefully. And Mark, the, uh, for Australians, uh, for the anonymous person in Australia, the best way to find out uh, what, what's going on and to plug into uh, the, the uh, CO2 Europe uh, database is to join CO2 Value Australia. Um, we, we welcome researchers, policy people, companies. Uh, it, it's not just an industry association. It's people who are interested in the ecosphere of uh, utilisation. Thank you, John. Last word, Wojciech. Well, I, I don't have any database on CO2 capture projects, but as I come from the, let's say, academic side of things, um, we, we do see a growth in the volume of research in that space. And I hope that this research will quickly convert into applications at mass industrial scale. And we will see that these databases will um, only increase of actual projects that we have around on CO2 capture. Fantastic. Thank you, Wojciech. And uh, we would need to close this now because we're almost a quarter of an hour um, over time. Uh, but again, I'd, I'd really like to thank uh, their panel, the, the panels, Celia, Wojciech and John, uh, for, for your earlier um, uh, presentations and questions and also for staying on to answer additional questions from the audience. Um, well engaged audience and 
uh, and uh, really appreciate um, that active uh, interaction from the audience in both in putting up questions and also in voting on those questions to get the ones you want answered. Thanks again, everyone, and I hope you have a great evening and a good a good morning to you, Celia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Yes. Bye bye.